Thank you very much, Carl, for inviting me. And thank you very much, David, for embarrassing me um, to, to your seminar. Um, so I want to talk today about, um, I think, the oldest project that I have that is still running. And it started, I think, in um, 2007, when I was still in Jerusalem. And it hasn't been completed since. And it, it's one of these projects that, that, that are just a nightmare at every step. And um, so we, we're now close to concluding. And I'm very uh, actually really happy for this opportunity to, to share um, some, uh, I, I think, interesting observations here. And, and I'm in particular happy for, for your feedback um, as we're trying to conclude this. There's a number of points where I would really um, be grateful for your advice. OK. So bef before um, something happens to the internet, I, I want to uh, thank uh, three people that, that have been with me on this project for a long time now. So one is uh, Chang Yu. He's now in this, uh, was former postdoc of mine in, in Göttingen. He's now an associate professor at Tianjin University. Um, my uh, mentor, Chaim Sampolinski, who was uh, on this project from the very beginning through, through now. And um, Isha Zurich here, who, who also was um, uh, very involved, uh, particularly in the beginning. OK. So before I tell you what I'm going to talk about, I, I just want to start with some, some uh, experimental data, which um, I, I always found extremely intriguing, uh, especially comp when, you, when, you, when you look at the models we are using to understand spike-based processing. So, so what you see here is an experiment by Henry Markram. And what Henry did is he patched two cells and recorded um, in the postsynaptic uh, cell here the, um, the, vo the voltage while he was stimulating the presynaptic cell with spikes. And what you see here is the EPSP by a single connection monosynaptic. And you see that the EPSP amplitude here uh, depends on, on the previous firing history of this cell. So when you wait long enough, the synapse is somewhat recovered here in the back to reach the um, initial uh, state. OK, so this is well-known, well-described. The molecular um, biology behind this is, is, is fairly advanced and well-understood. And I think that the models are still lagging. And, and, and it's not so clear what, what the models, models should actually look at when studying this uh, synaptic dynamics in, um, in spike-based processing. There, are, there is a lot of work, and there's a nice uh, review by Larry Abbott, um, using synaptic populations where all the synapses or you know, uh, large groups of synapses have exactly the same dynamics. What I want to focus on now is synapses that have individual dynamics. And, and that's because these dynamics are actually plastic. So what, what Henry Markram also did in his experiments, he actually exposed these cells to some plasticity inducing uh, protocols. And he observed that the, the dynamics that the EPSP amplitudes um, express change when the synapses are modified by various plasticity protocols. And I think this is particularly interesting in the light of the new generation of uh, uh, glutamate sniffers um, or reporter uh, proteins that are now starting to be used in experiments which allow really single uh, vesicle releases to be studied and recorded in, um, in uh, live tissue. OK. So this is the uh, task for the day. I, I want to you know, uh, introduce you or reintroduce you to the good old binary tempotron that we developed with Chaim in Jerusalem. The, so the, the work here is based on this model. It's a leaky integrate and fire neuron. I will, I will give you all the details. I will uh, reintroduce here the capacity task, which, which challenges this neuron to discriminate between two randomly labeled uh, sets of spike patterns. Um, and then I'm going to introduce multiple input spikes, which will probe the properties of synaptic dynamics and establish some boundaries on, on what uh, biological synapses might be able to do when having the appropriate uh, dynamics uh, in the synapses. Okay, in particular, I'm going to introduce something we call an ordinal synapse and the dynamical synapse, which is going to follow the, the well-established sodex markram model um, from the literature. OK, so let's start with the leak integrate and fire neuron, the, the, the textbook version here, the current based neuron. So we have a first order differential equation for the voltage um, governed by a membrane time constant tau m here. 
And when we, when we uh, solve this equation, we, we simply get the voltage as a function of time is, is a linear sum of uh, post-synaptic potentials, which, which come out here to be double exponentials. Um, again, one time here with the synaptic time, con uh, with the membrane time constant tau m and the synaptic time constant tau s. This is the time constant of the exponentially decaying current that is induced by activation of a presynaptic uh, uh, terminal. Now the amplitude of this current is Wi, which is, which is the parameter of, of this standard uh, synapse in this model. Um, and this scales the post-synaptic response. Um, the number of synapses I will use in this talk will always be uh, 100 capital N here. And I'm going to modify the number of spikes that each of these synapses receives between one, two, four, 10, and 20. Um, and the way we set the parameters here, tau m, tau s, is a very long story. It's essentially optimized for this kind of task. And uh, what, what's important for you to know is that tau m is going to be always twice tau s. And this actually is not so critical. So you can vary this factor here between one or four without much effect on the, the performance. But what is important is the scaling of, of, of both of these quantities inversely to the number of spikes, the total number of spikes. Um, in the input pattern, and that's n times n spikes. Okay, uh, all the, the kernels here are, are um, always normalized to unit amplitude. So, um, because we use the uh, leaky integrate and fire neuron here, um, when, the, when the voltage reaches the firing threshold, which is unity here, so that's why we normalize to unit amplitude, um, the neuron fires a spike and, and the trial is terminated here in this case. Okay. Now, normally I would ask you now if you have any questions, but since David didn't allow you to answer, I'll just continue. Um, so what, what I want to play with here today is, is the model of the synapse here. So instead of using the static synapse, the W here, we're going to allow this W to depend on the spike history, like, like the kind, basically any, any biological synapse in the brain that you might look at. So the, these dynamics can be very diverse. Um, and we'll just use some very simple um, caricatures of that. Okay, so now we can do a lot with the static synapse uh, first. So let, let's go through this. So um, just to, um, to introduce the, the old results that we have from 2006. So when we use latency patterns, and by that I mean we have N synapses here, N input channels, uh, each one carries one action potential randomly drawn from a uniform distribution here between zero and capital T, which is one here. Um, uh, we, can, we can just generate a whole range of those and label them with a random label, okay? So, so then we have a random labeled random pattern task. So there's nothing the neuron can learn except just to use its synapses to store the identity of target and null patterns. And the task is to, to fire at least one spike for a target pattern and, and to remain silent for the null. We, okay, so this, this is a legacy slide that I wanted to use. So this is actually old slides. I couldn't resist but to, to recycle them, but I didn't know that they turn out blue. Do you see them blue or white, the background, David? Anyway, it looks blue on mine now. It should be white. Um, anyway, okay, so this slide is broken. David, can you unmute yourself and tell me what you see because it looks broken on my... Blue. The background okay. is blue. Okay, so this is old slides um, that apparently didn't make it into the time. Um, okay, so let me jump over this. It's actually not so critical. Um, I'll explain it here. So, okay, so we have we have a, a, a range of um, of uh, patterns here from two categories, and the integrate and firing neuron has to signal targets by firing at least one spike and null by not firing at all. And um, what, what we have to clarify now, how, how should we change the synapses of this neuron if it fails? And this is the, um, the Tempotron learning. And now I just have to jump quickly over these broken slides till I get an equation which works, okay. So the Tempotron learning says that the cost function, which was on the previous slides you couldn't see, is the distance between the maximum potential of of the voltage trace for that particular pattern and the firing threshold. And, and if 
for instance, if the neuron was to supposed to fire a spike, but it didn't fire, then we're going to increase the weights so to minimize uh, this distance, to bring the maximum potential. So V of T max time, this is the time of the maximum voltage potential to bring this closer to the threshold. Okay, so all we have to do is to take the gradient of, of the voltage trace you see here in the top row with respect to W. So it's very simple, obviously, because it's linear. So we just get the sum of the um, postsynaptic potentials of that particular synapse. And because we have only one spike here in this case, it's even simpler. It's just the, the kernel um, of one, one spike here. Okay. So now I need to jump over the other broken slides here, which is just an illustration of how the learning works. So I need it. Okay. So if we do this, the, the neuron converges. And obviously, the, the difficulty of the task uh, is controlled by the number of patterns, P, which we're trying to store here. Okay, because there's no structure the neuron can learn at some point, it just cannot uh, generate the correct responses if P is too big relative to N. So uh, we use the standard quantity alpha, the load is P divided by the, um, the number of spikes. Um, okay, this should be capital N here, and this is a typo, sorry. Um, and as you increase P, what we measure is the, the, the time it takes, the number of cycles that it takes the neuron to find a solution for this task. And this is a, a sort of, it, it's, a, it's a nasty looking slide, but it's actually even more nasty to do this. You know? So this, this is an extremely uh, computational power consuming operation, what we have to do if we want to really get the capacity here. Um, and please let me know if you know some, some smarter or better way to do this. Okay, so what we do is we, we pick a P, let's say 300 here, uh, uh, 300 patterns. So alpha is, uh, if we have 100 uh, synapses, alpha would be a three here in this case. And we run um, a very expensive uh, Gaussian process optimization to find the right learning parameters. So we have, we have the step size lambda here and the, the momentum uh, parameter mu. This is the standard momentum learning. And for this given P, we optimize these parameters. And obviously, as you approach the capacity limit, these, these optimizations take forever because you need to you know, wait for a long time for, to achieve convergence. Um, then we take these optimal parameters and then we run what, what would be called sort of a critical P task. So we, we increase P and we get a divergence here in, in the... Um, in the, in the learning times. And after having done this once, we then can estimate for which P we should re-optimize. So we take a value here, which we know which still converges. Um, and then we repeat the whole process several times. And this is extremely time consuming. We, we don't, it's very hard to automate it because you need to choose the next uh, optimization P here. Um, so, so this is really a pain. And, and once we have the final uh, set of points here, um, we use uh, kind of, so what we want to get at is the critical alpha here at which the median, the, we want the probability to have a solution to be one half. So basically we want the median to diverge. So we fit a curve here and then we, we can estimate this alpha C from this fit. Okay, so that's the procedure. And it actually doesn't really matter what kind of exact divergence you use here. But again, if you, if you know any good way to do this, please, um, give me feedback later or write me an email. So this is the current uh, form that we're using. It's still slightly preliminary. So we're still in the process of searching a good, good way to estimate the critical alpha here. Okay, so, so we can measure alpha. And now I'm going to do what, what, I, what I want. I want to get at the dynamic synapse. So now we need to change the number of spikes. So this, this was the old result here, the three, roughly three. So this we knew from 256, even we didn't have this computer power to, to do this right. And now I'm going to um, add more spikes here. So I'm, I want to keep talking. This will sound a bit confusing now, but it will make things easier later. So I want to keep talking about N synapses here. And now N spikes is just the number of, uh, of spikes for each synapse. And obviously for the simple static uh, binary leaky integrated fire neuron here, it's, it's the number of spikes and weight is simply N times N spikes. Okay. so it's, a bit silly uh, notation here, but, but it will, will be useful later. 
Okay, so if we have four spikes per synapse, this now we're working with 400 spikes in the pattern and 400 weights. So, so this is now how the pattern would look. And the color of these points here, and this is just the weight. So, so the more saturated, the, the stronger the weight is just symbolic and, and red is negative and blue is positive. So the weights here can change um, polarity. Okay, so, so now this is by increasing from one spike to four spikes. And now we can do this for a range of number of spikes and, and, and again, measure alpha, see the critical uh, capacity. And by dividing by the number of spikes here, I, I just basically can re reaffirm that, that the, the whole concept of capacity makes sense even in this leaky integrated fire neuron, which is not so surprising. Um, so we get a constant uh, capacity um, here, which is stays roughly around three. Okay, so now let's take all these spikes and put them back onto one synapse. Okay, so now we'll have four spikes. So we have a latency uh, task with, with, let's say four instead of one spike. And the question is now, what will be the capacity? Still with just a static synapse. Okay, so we'll do this here for the whole task again. And um, now we basically collapsed um, four spikes on this. Now this, I don't know, I hope there's a simple answer which we just don't know why this is the way it is. Um, and again, if somebody has a good intuition here, please let us know. Um, so it turns, so obviously the, the patterns are, are, should be more easy to discriminate, right? Because they're clearly more different, right? There's more information now that we have more spikes. But for the neuron, it, it turns out that it's actually, it might be easier to fire more, but maybe it's harder not to fire more for, for the null patterns. But so the result is that the capacity stays exactly the same. So there's no increase as you add more spikes on a static synapse. So again, I'm sure there's a good explanation, but I just don't know why this should be like this. Um, so this, this dash line here is just the one over n spikes decrease. Okay, so there's absolutely no gain for the static synapse model here from the more spikes it got, even though the patterns really dramatically change. Okay, so, so the dynamics uh, synapses will, will, will have to live somewhere here in between. And I would like to start um, by considering the most extreme dynamic synapse, um, which we, we call the ordinal synapse. Okay, so, so this, is, this is a super synapse. This synapse can do anything um, and could do any weight. So obviously this is not biologically plausible, but um, just as, a, as an extreme Gedanken experiment, let's think of uh, the synapse being able to give a new weight to each spike it receives. Okay, so, so here we have uh, Wij simply, and, and we can use the same neuron model and the same learning rule. This is, um, I find very intriguing. So the most diverse or powerful synapse here um, has, has the simplest learning exactly the same that we had before. The, now, the only thing that we really need to make sure is that we order the spikes, okay? So this is critical. So the difference between this ordinal synapse and the previous model that I showed you is that the four spikes that arrive on what we call one synapse have to be in the same order, okay? So, so you see that this here is violated, so we have to reorder them, okay? So let's say this the top synapse you always gets the first spike, the second, the second, the third, the third. Okay, so that's why we call it the ordinal synapse. This synapse attributes the weight according to the order of the spike. It doesn't care about the timing, but it 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 has to keep the order. And that's that's obviously true for biological synapses. The, the third spike will never arrive before the second spike or we before because then it wouldn't be the third. Okay. So Let's, let's now reorder these patterns, all of them. And you, you see that they already start looking more similar. So this is here the case. And that's of course, because we, we, we impose a lot of structure here. So the result of the capacity that we will get for this kind of input statistic will be the bound for any dynamical synapse that we can get in this task. Okay, because this synapse can, it doesn't have to care about any time. 
as soon as the spike is the next spike, it can give it a new weight. The only thing it has to obey is, again, that on each of these pattern, the, let's say this synapse always here, this weight always gets the second spike in the second row here, and so on. Okay, now obviously if we, you know, if the number of spikes was very, very large, then these patterns would start look very similar. So at some point, at least my intuition is that this will, will not be, uh, you know, th this will not work anymore. But um, for, for the biological regime that we're in here, up to 20 spikes, and the limit here is simply because our computers collapse at this point, because the capacity gets very high and we just cannot add more spikes and do all this optimization that we're doing. Um, so the red crosses show you that this synapse actually is not at all interested in this reordering. Okay, so in principle, if we had a synapse that could realize this sort of highly flexible weight assignment based on the ordering of the spikes, we could regain the capacity as if these um, spikes had independent weights. Okay, and this is, I think it's very, I, I don't know, to me it's actually striking and, and it means that, that in principle, you know, a, a biological system could use a number of spikes to play with the capacity of the circuit. Okay, so, so what we have here, the crosses here scale with the number of spikes and not the number of the synapses. Okay, now there's an obvious limitation that I just want to check whether, whether this actually plays a big role. And this is in, in this ordinal synapse that I use, the plain one, the, the different spikes can actually get different polarity in the weights. So you see here the top one changed from uh, very positive to very negative uh, between the second and third spike. Okay, and this is something that I think hasn't yet at least been observed that, that uh, real synapses can do this in the brain. So I think that we have strong modulations and there's synapses that can really, um, you know, I think by 100% or, or even 1000%, the MOSI fibers can, can modulate their amplitude, but they never uh, reverse the polarities. So, so let's think about uh, a synapse where this cannot happen, where, where these groups have the same polarities and, and see how this affects. Um, that capacity. Okay, so now, now we have to work a bit harder. So this was our ordinal synapse. And now we want to sign constrained ordinal synapse. So what we did, and this is the result of, you know, uh, countless attempts and, and various models and various forms. And so, so what we end up doing is we pull out a common factor here. And so we have two weights now for each synapse. Um, or two types of weights. We have the scale here, the W, which, which doesn't care about the order of the spike. And then we have an independent uh, a weight, um, which is scaled by, for each channel uh, by the scale here. We just use the L1 norm. Yeah, we can try different, the, 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 which norm you use is not so critical here. And the, the L1 norm works slightly better than L2 and 3, but it's not really a big, big effect here. Um, exactly. So, so how does the learning work? So now we, we have a slightly more complicated gradient. We have, um, as before, um, we have the dvdw. So this now, again, is very simple. It's just sort of the, the remainder here of this voltage equation. Um, and then we have, in addition, the dvdy. This is the, so each, this is the actual spike specific uh, contribution to the weight here. And that's slightly more complicated. So first of all, what you have to note, it scales with the WI here, which, which makes the learning um, problematic when Ws are small. So these, these weights can get stuck for very small weights. So this is something to, to keep in mind here. And, and then we have two terms here. One is the normal term that scales with the um, PSP that we had uh, even before in the learning. But, but now we have this correction here, which stems from the norm the fact that we normalize here. So when, um, when weight is the, let, let's say a certain um, V max is only uh, controlled by one of the Y's here, let's say the first one, then, um, then the amount of change will depend on how, how much is the relative contribution of that particular weight. And, and if it's already a, the dominant contribution, then there will be no further change because most of the 
uh, change is carried by the W, but if it's a weak uh, Y here, then it will actually get a big change to re, uh, reorder the, the dominance in, in that particular channel. Okay, so it's a, it's a find it a very cute uh, learning rule here and, and let's see how it works. So here, this is now the green crosses. This is the sign constraint ordinal synapse. And what you see, um, it of course, it loses a little bit uh, of performance here. And that's of course, because we have a fairly heavy constraint here on the weights. We don't allow them anymore to change the sign for, for a given channel. But the good news is that actually it still scales very favorably with the end spikes. Okay, so, so even though we don't allow the ordering of the spikes to shift in, in this channel, and we don't allow the polarity of the weights to change, we still have a, a fairly um, powerful scaling here um, with, the, with the number of spikes. Okay, so, so the, the intuition or the idea that we could use um, the number of spikes to, to turn up the, the capacity or performance of a neural circuit um, rather than having to put new wires into the brain is still alive here. Okay, so, so let's now look at um, the, the, the heuristic model of the dynamic synapse. This is uh, well uh, written, uh, described in the literature. Um, I use here a version by uh, Zurich, Pavelsic, and Markram from uh, 98. Um, and so the, the weight here is, is replaced by a, a product of two sort of synaptic state variables. So we still have a scale WI here, but then in addition, we have what's called a, a, a U variable, which is kind of, you can loosely think of it as, as the release probability. And we have a, a X, which sort of is called the, the amount of available synaptic resources. So before showing you the math here, I just uh, give you some more intuition first. So we have this X variable here which with every input spike, the light gray bars here, uh, the vertical lines. So the X drops, this is the amount of available resources. Of course, there is a, if there's a release and this drops, and then the tau rec is the recovery time constant governs how fast this X recovers back to one. Okay, so here the recovery is fairly slow. So with every new spike, uh, the resources start dropping more, keep dropping. And then here we have a slightly longer recovery period. So you see the red going back to one or on the way to one, and then there's more release. So it goes back to zero or towards zero. Um, okay, now opposite for the U. So both of these variables go between zero and one, but um, so the U has a baseline value, which is actually a parameter. That's the capital U here, UI. So this is the baseline um, probability of release, if you want. And then this can facilitate. So whenever there's, the idea is that there's some calcium influx and then this calcium accumulates and, and the release probability rises. And this uh, falls back down to the baseline value with time constant tau facilitation. Here. This the, the, so, so we have these four parameters here. We have the baseline release probability, tau recovery and tau facilitation, and then overall scale W. And all of these need to be learned to control this uh, dynamic scheme. Okay, so let me give you a, a bit more details here. So um, we have the baseline. So now, now we have to talk about these, these dynamic uh, parameters here, which step every time that there's a spike, every, every release event, these are updated. And in between the re, uh, release events, they recover with these time constants here, as I said. So the, baseline value UI here controls the response, the release probability for the first spike. And then we have these recursive equations, um, which, which are put down in, in the paper that I referenced. So every time um, we have, um, we add some more facilitation here to the U and uh, we're competing against the decay back to zero here or to the baseline uh, with the facilitation time constant, this exponential decay here. Same, same true for the X. So we have the, the baseline value one, the available resources. And then um, um, the, so here there's actually coupling. So the U only depends on the U, but the X of course, because you can't release anything if the release probability is small. So, so it, it couples to the U here. 
and the amount of resources that are depleted depends on the, on the current uh, view, the, the state of the synapse. Okay, so so now for a given spike, you can you can depending on the order, you have to iterate these equations, and then you get the the actual fraction of W that this spikes elicit. Now, if you if you naively try to compute the gradient based on this dynamics, it will actually give you a lot of headache, and this happened to me for several years, and and it just. Yeah, as I said, this was really a very unpleasant project. And, and, and one of the reasons is that it took me very long to realize the following, the way that the, the natural parameterization here goes, that you have actually two scales um, that are uh, redundant in the U here and the W. Okay, so it's just a product. So by, by you, you can really make the things work much, much better by reparameterizing this model to introduce a, a W that, that um, is a single scale here a bit like the sign constraint ordinal synapse. Um, and in, and then, then you end up with a, with a U that has a baseline of one, which, which is much simpler. So now um, the easiest way to see this, if you look at the gradients now, then, then this does not depend on UI anymore. So the first spike will not induce any change in the U in, in the baseline value here. Whereas before the gradient here was one. Okay, if you look at the derivative of the U with respect to capital U. So, so this, this model is already on this simple inspection here, you see that it behaves much better because you shouldn't change U from the first spike because there's no dynamics involved. Right? Okay, so, so in, in my hands, this works much better. And uh, we can just look at this, this just the schematic gradients here. Um, so we have these four gradients um, for each of the parameters, W, U, I, Tau I recovery and Tau I facilitary facilitation, and um, yeah, I'm not I'm, just, I'm not um, going to to go deeper in here. So so this is just pages of of uh, algebra here. It's, there's nothing really hard about it, but it's fairly complex, and there's there's not much insight you can you can get by just inspecting it. Um, yeah. So again, you have uh, the W here scaling like with the, with the sign constraint ordinance synapse in before. So this also this learning dynamics is prone to get stuck when W is very small. So what, what we did, we spent a lot of time doing teacher student learning where we have a, some random teacher neuron and we're trying to, to learn it in student um, based on the labels provided by the teaching system. And, and, and when, when the Ws are small in the teacher, this, this takes forever to converge. But when, the, when you make sure that the Ws are not close to zero, then this works very well. So this gradient, um, when, the, when the teacher has no sort of pathological uh, weights, um, uh, very reliably manages to find it. Um, there's, a, there's a second problem. Um, I mean, you see here that, that the derivatives here, of course, will all scale with these exponentials, right? So when, when your taus are, are too small, then, then also the learning will become very, very small. But that, that's the usual vanishing gradient stuff that you can deal with some kind of adaptive learning style. And we, we don't use any of this, but we played with it a lot. Okay, so now let's go back to, um, to these weights here and see what the dynamic synapse can do here. And you see here the, the blue circles now, that we are really right in between the, the crosses here. So we have, um, for, for, the, for the high number of spikes, of course the synapse has only four parameters, right? So, so there's not much we can expect, but so here the scaling uh, starts dropping again, like one over n. But but here in the when the n is smaller or not too large, then we actually uh, are closer to those um, ordinal synapses here. And just intriguingly, to to uh, so a way that we can basically characterize that particular synapse is maybe by looking at at the 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 independent neuron model, so these open surface here, but but just giving it two independent weights per synapse. And then, then we just get go to this line. And you see, it's actually very surprising to me that, and I also don't know if, the, if this is an accident or if this, there's some deeper reason here. So the four parameter um, Sodex Markram synapse here lies actually exactly on the line that, that the static synapse would get with two weights per channel. Okay, so it's a really striking uh, uh, agreement here. Okay, so, 
Now the question is, you can ask, okay, so, so first of all, if, if you had a more complicated synapse, you could probably hope to get more even higher up here if for more number of spikes. I don't know what's biologically uh, realistic. If you look at, I don't know, we, we have something, I don't know, on the order of a few tens of milliseconds uh, of integration time constant. So I don't think you need much more than four spikes or 10. So, so this is really already here, the region where, where maybe biology uh, can operate. So you, I, you know, I guess you need a few more time constants and you could, could hope to, to get uh, the scaling uh, with the number of spikes. Um, so, so let's check if we have to actually train all parameters. Maybe, maybe it's enough to have the dynamics, even if it's random and just to train maybe the W and by having the richness of the response, we can still harvest some of this capacity. So this is what we did here. So we have these two cases. The static is our reference at one. And we see that, that this is the doubling here. Um, yeah, this is the doubling uh, when we have the full model, the full Misha, uh, the full uh, Zodix Markham model. Now in between here, we, we initialize the neuron by training on the, sa on the same task, but a different batch. And then we keep those, um, those use those tau recovery tau facilitary and we just reshuffle the w and, and retrain w and you see that this doesn't give you anything it's exactly like static okay so the dynamic really helps you only in the capacity task here when you train it okay so this is obviously a very interesting question and i hope that the people that are developing these uh, glutamat sniffing reporters can can soon address this you know when you change the synapse is the specific learning rules to change these parameters. Um, and you have something here in between when we just train W and U. And we, we keep again the tau recovery tau facilitation from, from the same statistic that the solution has, but trained on a different batch. And, and again, you, you don't get the full. Now you can add here the tau and you get something more in between, but, not interesting. but to get the full capacity here, you really have to train all of these. Um, to get it. So not enough to have the dynamics, but the dynamics has to be specific for that particular batch. Okay. So now that's maybe all interesting, but, but why, why do we care about capacity here? Okay, so obviously we just use this as a proxy um, because it's just, you know, gives you some idea about the, the, the performance, the computation performance of a model, but, but actually you know, there's an old standing uh, result that, that if you have higher capacity, you can actually trade it for better generalization because you can be more robust. So let's see if this is true here also. And, and because, you know, this is kind of intriguing, we were, we're using the dynamics to generate the increase in capacity. We thought it would be particularly cute to now, you know, do generalization with respect to noise in the time axis that is used here to increase it. Okay, so, so we're going to add jitter now to all the spike patches. Okay, so we have the same task, but the neuron actually never sees the templates from the batch, but it only sees some jittered versions. Okay, and we, we modify here the sigma of the spike jitter, and we just measure the, the generalization error and training errors as usual on, on training and on test batches. Okay, so, so for jitter, let's say of two milliseconds, this is just to show you how the learning curves look, for an example. So here the, the, the load is two. Let me go back so you see this here. Yeah, don't worry, I didn't forget to put it on the slide. But anyway, so for a load of two, if you put two millisecond jitter and you train and train, um, you see the, um, the dynamic synapse here drops, keeps actually dropping even after 100, uh, no, after 1 million cycles. So this is runs again that are extremely, extremely expensive. And, and this is the, the uh, comparable, uh, the binary tempotron with static synapses and this almost converged here um, and doesn't drop off. So, so the plot I'm going to show you is actually underestimates the difference here because you see this still improving. And this you see here for different uh, noise levels here. Um, so the solid line here is the dynamic synapse neuron and the dash or the dotted line here is the standard static synapse. And you see, so this is actually a plot that's very similar to the one in the old 2006 paper. 
Um, so as you increase sigma here, the error starts rising already, you know, in the sub millisecond range, but the dynamic synapse can use the increase in capacity to, to really become much more robust, um, even though, you know, you're actually using the dynamics in time and the noise is at the same dimension. Okay, we can change the load. So now I'm going to alpha equals one. So of course, both curves move to the left here to, they can tolerate higher jitter. And, and you see, this is again in, intriguing. I, I find that, that um, now the factor of two that we had in the capacity seems to almost apply also to the, to the level of sigma that these neurons can give us. Uh, of course, again, this doesn't, didn't have to be like this. So um, for half of the load, uh, the, the model with half the capacity uh, lies here. And the same is true for even the higher load. So alpha equals four and becomes very similar to uh, alpha equals two for the, for the static synapse here and, and for half. So we can go to higher and higher jitter. Okay, very good. So let me just summarize what we've seen. Uh, we've seen that the storage capacity of tempo transfers ordinal synapses, synapses that only care about the order of spikes, um, scales with the number of input spikes, even if we, if we uh, size constrain them. So I think this, this opens the avenue to, to have, uh, again, an input layer deciding about the computational power of the, of the upstage layer by, by sending more spikes. And, and this is something that, that you know, if in the static synapse case, it would be completely you know, futile to send more spikes because there's nothing there, and, you know, no effect on the capacity of the downstream layer. Um, we have seen that, that even the simple uh, Zodex macro mo heu heu heuristic model um, can, can actually realize some of this uh, increase in capacity. And it actually acts like as if it had two independent weights, even though you know the dynamics in that model is very constrained. There's really not much freedom, and the time constants are fairly large of the of the tau recovery. So it's really you there's yeah. W once you put down the response to the second spike, there's not that much you can do with the third. So this actually is maybe not so surprising. And um, yeah, and and the, the synaptic dynamics can actually increase the robustness to 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 temporal jitter, even though it's using the temporal dynamics. Um, okay, so what, what are maybe some things we, we should do uh, next or in addition? So, so, so one big problem of, of the whole model class that we've used here is that they're actually not stochastic. Okay, so, so we, we're operating in the kind of average sense here, right? So, so once the spikes are really, so we talk about the probability of release, but then we act as if it's actually deterministic. Okay, so either we are in some kind of average mode here, um, or we, we really need to work harder um, to, to check whether this will survive some averaging in, in, the, in the downstream sense. Okay, so this, this is a big white spot in our map, but it's, it's just, we're at the limit of what we can do with our computers at this stage already. Now, um, then obviously one, one reason why we do all this uh, which I haven't talked about because we haven't done it yet is, is to actually not do random label tasks, but to do some interesting tasks to actually use these dynamics to extract some temporal feature. So in order to, this, to do this well, we need to, um, to use the, um, the multi-spike tempotron, which I haven't talked about at all, but David mentioned it and equip it with uh, dynamical synapses. Okay, and then, then we maybe can really do some interesting processing. Um, and then obviously now very exciting, I think um, we should, should really get to talk to, to experimentalists who have access to this new technology to actually measure the, with a single, we can resolve single uh, vesicle release events. So you should really be able to see uh, how these dynamics can change. Okay, so, so uh, if you're still here, um, I, can, I want to thank again my, my collaborators here, Chang, Chaim and Misha and acknowledge funding by the uh, European Research Council and the Berlin University Alliance. And with this, I'm done. And 45 minutes is the answer to David's question, how long it will take. Okay, thank you.